Chapter 12 Nitya Dharma, Sadhan and Sadhya Sri Navadvip Mandal is supreme among all holy places of the world. Like Sri Vrindavan, it has a circumference of 32 square miles and is shaped like an eight-petal lotus flower. The center of that lotus is Sri Antadvip, the core of which is Sri Mayapur. To the north of Sri Mayapur is Sri Simantadweep, where a temple of Sri Simantini Devi is situated. To the north of this temple is the village of Bilva Pushkarini, and to the south lies Brahmana Pushkarini. That area which is located in the northern section of Sri Navadweep is commonly referred to as Simulia. At the time of Sri Mahaprabhu, Sumulia was the residence of many learned pandits. The father of Sachidev, Sri Nilambara Chakravati Mahashai, had also lived in this village. Now, not far from where Nilambara Chakravati's house still stood, lived a Vedic Brahmana named Brajanath Bhattacharya. Brajanath had been brilliant from his childhood. He had studied in a Sanskrit school in Bilva Pushkarini and had become such a superior scholar of the science of logic, Nyaya Shastra, that his ingenious and innovative arguments embarrassed and intimidated all the renowned scholars of Bilva Pushkarini, Brahmana Pushkarini, Mayapur, Godruma, Madhyadvip, Armagata, Samudraga, Kulia, Puravashtali, and other places. Wherever there was a gathering of pundits, Brajanath Nyaya Panchanana would set the assembly ablaze with a barrage of unprecedented arguments. Among these pundits was a cruel-hearted logician named Naika Chudamani, who was deeply mortified by the wounds he had received from the sharp blows of Brajanath's logic. This logician resolved to kill Nyaya Panchanana, using the occult knowledge described in the Tantra Shastra, by which one can evoke another's death through mystical incantations. To this end, he moved into the cremation ground in Rudradvip and began to utter death mantras day and night. It was Amavasya, the night of the new moon, and dense darkness pervaded all the four directions. At midnight, Nyayika Chudamani sat in the middle of the cremation ground and called out to his worshipable deity, O Mother, you are the only worshipable deity in this Kali Yuga. I have heard that you become pleased simply by the recitation of a few mantras, and that you easily bestow benediction upon your worshippers. O Goddess with a terrifying face, this servant of yours has undergone tremendous hardship in reciting your mantras for many days. Please be merciful upon me just once. O Mother, although I am plagued with many faults, you are still my mother. Please excuse all my faults and appear before me today. In this way, Repeatedly calling out with cries of distress, Nyaya Chudamani offered oblations in the fire while uttering a mantra in the name of Brajanath Nyaya Panchanana. How astonishing was the power of that mantra! The sky immediately became overcast with a mass of dense dark clouds. A fierce wind began to blow and deafening peals of thunder roared. Hideous ghosts and evil spirits could be seen in the intermittent flashes of lightning. With the help of the sacrificial wine, Chudamani summoned all his energy and called out, O oh mother, please do not delay another moment. Just then an oracle from the heavens replied, Do not worry, Brajanath Nyaya Panchanana will not discuss Nyaya Shastra for long. Within a few days he will give up debating and remain silent. He will no longer be your rival. Be peaceful and return home. When the pundit heard this oracle, he became satisfied. He repeatedly offered pranam to Mahadev, the chief of the Devas and author of the Tantra, and then returned to his own home. Brajanath Nyaya Panchanana had become a Dig Vijay Pandit, one who has conquered the four directions through scholarship, at the age of twenty-one. Day and night he studied the books of the famous logician, Sri Ganga Shopadaya, who had initiated a new system of logic known as Navya-nyaya. Brajanath had found many faults in Raghunath Kanaibata Shiromani's Diditi, 
which was a celebrated commentary on Gongo Shopodaya's Tattva Chintamani, and he had begun to write his own commentary. Although he never thought of material enjoyment, the word Paramatta, spiritual reality, never so much as entered his ears. His single focus in life was to initiate logical debates using the concepts and terminology of Nyaya, such as Avacheda, the property of an object by which it is distinguished from everything else, Vyavacheda, exclusion of one object from another, Gata, a clay pot, and Pata, a piece of cloth. While sleeping, dreaming, eating, or moving about, his heart was filled with thoughts about the nature of objects, the nature of time, and the peculiarities of aqueous and terrestrial properties. One evening, Brajanath was sitting on the bank of the Ganga, contemplating the sixteen categories propounded by Gautam in his system of logic, when a new student of the Nyaya Shastra approached him. Nyaya Panchanana Mahashai, said the student. Have you heard Nimai Pandit's logical refutation of the atomic theory of creation? Naya Panchanana roared like a lion. Who is Nimai Pandit? Are you speaking about the son of Jagannath Mishra? Tell me about his logical arguments. The student said, A great person named Nimai Pandit lived in Navadweep just a short time ago. He composed many innovative logical arguments related to the Nyaya Shastra and thus embarrassed Kanaibata Shiromani. During his time, there was no scholar equal to him in mastery of the Nyaya Shastra. Yet, even though he was so adept in the Nyaya Shastra, he considered it quite insignificant. Indeed, he regarded not only the Nyaya Shastra, but the entire material world as trifling. He therefore adopted the life of a wandering mendicant in the renounced order, and travelled from place to place propagating the chanting of Harinam. Present-day Vaishnavas accept him as Purna Brahman, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and they worship him with the Sri Gora Hari Mantra. Nyaya Panchanana Mahashai, you must look into his dialectical arguments at least once. After hearing such praise of Nimai Pandit's logical reasoning, Brajanath Nyaya Panchanana became quite curious to hear his arguments. With difficulty, he was able to collect a few of those arguments from various sources. Human nature is such that when one develops faith in a particular subject, he will naturally feel regard for the teachers of that subject. Moreover, for various reasons, common people do not easily develop faith in exalted personalities who are still living whereas they tend to develop great faith in the activities of Mahajans who have passed away. Nyaya Panchanana developed unshakable faith in Nimai Pandit by studying his logical thesis. Brajanath would say, O Nimai Pandit, if I had been born during your time, there is no telling how much I could have learned from you. O Nimai Pandit, kindly enter my heart just once. You are truly Purna Brahma, for otherwise... How could such extraordinary logical arguments have come from your mind? You are undoubtedly Gora Hari, for you have destroyed the darkness of ignorance by creating such remarkable arguments. The darkness of ignorance is black, but you have removed it by becoming Gora, fair-complexioned. You are Hari, because you can steal the minds of the entire world. You have stolen away my heart with the ingenuity of your logic. Repeatedly speaking in this way, Brajanath became somewhat frantic. He called out loudly, O Nimai Pandit, O Gora Hari, please be merciful to me. When will I be able to create logical arguments like yours? If you are merciful unto me, there is no telling how great a scholar of the Nyaya Shastra I may become. Brajanath thought to himself, It seems to me that those who worship Gora Hari must also be attracted to Nimai Pandit's scholarship in Nyaya, just as I am. I should go to them and see whether they have any books that he has composed on Nyaya. Thinking like this, Brajanath developed a desire to associate with the devotees of Goranga. By constantly uttering the pure names of Bhagavan, such as Nimai Pandit and Gora Hari, and by desiring to associate with the devotees of Gora, Brajanath earned tremendous Sukriti. One day, 
While Brajanath was taking a meal with his paternal grandmother, he asked, Grandmother, did you ever see Gora Hari? Upon hearing the name of Sri Garanga, Brajanath's grandmother nostalgically remembered her childhood and said, Ah, what an enchanting form he had! Alas, will I ever behold his beautiful sweet form again? Can anyone who has seen that captivating form ever engage her mind in domestic affairs again? When he performed Harinam Kirtan, absorbed in ecstatic trance, the birds, beasts, trees and creepers of Navadweep would completely lose consciousness of the external world due to intoxication of Prem. Even now, when I contemplate these thoughts, an incessant flow of tears streams uncontrollably from my eyes and soaks my breast. Brajanath inquired further, Do you recall any pastimes that he performed? Grandmother replied, I certainly do, my son. When Sri Goranga would visit the house of his maternal uncle with Mother Sachi, the elderly ladies of our house fed him shuck, spinach, and rice. He would praise the shuck very highly and eat it with great love. At that precise moment, Brajanath's own mother placed some shuck on his plate. Seeing it and appreciating the serendipity of the moment, Brajanath became overjoyed. This is the beloved shuck of the logician Nimai Pandit, he said, and ate it with the utmost reverence. Although Brajanath was completely lacking in transcendental knowledge of absolute reality, he became extremely attracted to Nimai Pandit's brilliant scholarship. Indeed, the intensity of his attraction could not be estimated. Even the name of Nimai was a delight to his ears. When mendicants came to beg alms uttering Jai Sachinandan, he received them warmly and fed them. He would sometimes go to Mayapur, where he would hear the Babaji's chanting the names of Goranga, and he would ask them many questions about Goranga's triumphant activities in the field of scholarship and learning. After a few months of these activities, Brajanath was no longer his former self. Previously, Nimai's name had pleased him only in connection with his scholarship in Nyaya, but now Nimai pleased him in all respects. Brajanath lost all interest in studying and teaching Nyaya, and no longer had any taste for dry arguments or debate. Nimai the logician no longer had any standing in the kingdom of his heart, for Nimai the devotee had usurped all authority. Brajanath's heart would begin to dance when he heard the sound of Mridanga and cartels, and he would offer pranam within his mind whenever he saw pure devotees. He displayed great devotion towards Sri Navadweep, respecting it as the birthplace of Sri Gaurangadev. When rival pundits saw that Nyaya Panchanana had become soft-hearted, they were very pleased at his condition. Now they could openly step out of their houses without fear. Nayayika Pandit thought that his worshipable deity had rendered Brajanath inactive and there was no longer any need to be afraid. One day, while Brajanath was sitting in a secluded place on the bank of the Bhagirati, he thought to himself, if such a profound scholar of the Naya Shastra as Nimai could renounce logic and adopt the path of bhakti, what fault would there be if I should do the same? While I was obsessed with Nyaya, I could not apply myself to the cultivation of bhakti, nor could I bear to hear the name of Nimai. In those days, I was so immersed in the Nyaya Shastra that I could not even find time to eat, drink or sleep. Now I see things quite the opposite way. I no longer contemplate the topics of the Nyaya Shastra. Instead, I always remember the name of Goranga. Still, even though the ecstatic devotional dancing of the Vaishnavas captivates my mind, I am the son of a Vedic Brahmana. I was born in a prestigious family, and I am highly respected in society. Although I truly believe that the behavior and conduct of the Vaishnavas is excellent, it is inappropriate for me to adopt their ways outwardly. There are many Vaishnavas in Sri Mayapur at Kola Bangadanga, where Chankazi broke the Mridanga to stop the Sankirtan, and at Vairagi Danga, the place of Vaishnava asceticism. I feel happy and purified at heart when I see the radiance of their faces. But amongst all those devotees, it is Sri Raghunath Das Babaji Mahashai who completely captivates my mind. 
When I see him, my heart fills with faith. I would like to be by his side continuously and learn the Bhakti Shastras from him. It is said in the Vedas, Atmava are drastavya, shotavyo mantavyo niditya sitavya. One should see, hear about, think of, and meditate on the Supreme Absolute Truth. In this mantra, the word mantavya means to be thought of, to be considered or examined, to be admitted or assumed, to be approved or sanctioned, or to be called into question. Although this word suggests that one should acquire brahma Gyan by studying the Naya Shastra, the word Shrotavya, to be heard or learned from a teacher, implies the necessity for something greater. So far, I have spent much of my life in useless arguments and debate. Now I long to dedicate myself to the feet of Sri Gora Hari. It will therefore be most beneficial for me to go after sunset and take darshan of Sri Raghunath Das Babaji Mahashai. Brajanath set out for Sri Mayapur at the close of day. The sun was rapidly vanishing below the western horizon, but its crimson rays were still dancing amidst the treetops. A gentle breeze blew from the south, and birds flew in various directions, returning to their nests. The first few stars were gradually appearing in the sky. As Brajanath arrived in Srivasanga, the courtyard of Srivas Thakur's house, the Vaishnavas began Sandhya Ati in worship of Bhagavan, chanting and singing with sweet voices. Brajanath took his seat on a platform beneath a bakula tree. His heart melted as he heard the Arti Kirtan of Gora Hari, and when it ended, the Vaishnavas joined him on the platform. At that time, the elderly Raghunath Das Babaji Mahashai came and took a seat on the platform chanting Jai Sachinandana, Jai Nityananda, Jai Rupsanatan, Jai Das Goswami. As he did so, everyone rose and offered him Dandavat Pranam, and Brajanath also felt compelled to do the same. When the aged Babaji Mahashai saw the extraordinary beauty of Brajanath's face, he embraced him and requested him to sit by his side. Who are you, my son? asked Babaji. Brajanath replied, I am one who is thirsting for the truth, and I long to receive some instruction from you. A Vaishnava seated nearby recognized Brajanath and said, His name is Brajanath Nyaya Panchanana. There is no scholar of Nyaya equal to him in all of Navadweep, but now he has developed some faith in Sachinandan. Hearing of Brajanath's vast erudition, the elderly Babaji said courteously, my dear son, you are a great scholar, and I am a foolish and wretched soul. You are a resident of the holy dham of our Sachinandan, and we are therefore objects of your mercy. How can we instruct you? Kindly share with us some of the purifying narrations of your Garanga, and pacify our burning hearts. As Babaji Maharaj and Brajanath conversed in this way, the other Vaishnavas gradually arose and dispersed to resume their respective services. Brajanath said, Babaji Mahashai, I was born in a Brahmana family, and as a result I am very proud of my learning. Because of my egoism of high birth and knowledge, I think this earth is within the grip of my hand. I have no idea how to honor sadhus and great persons. I cannot say by what good fortune I have awakened faith in your character and behavior. I wish to ask you a few questions. Please answer them, understanding that I have not come to you with any ulterior motive. Brajanath then asked Babaji Mahashai fervently, Kindly instruct me, what is the jiva's ultimate goal of life, sadhya, and what is the means, sadhan, to attain that goal? While I was studying the Nyaya Shastra, I concluded that the jiva is eternally separate from Ishwara, and that the mercy of Ishwara is the only cause of the jiva's obtaining mukti. I have understood that the particular method by which the mercy of Ishwara may be obtained is called sadhan. The result that is achieved through sadhan is known as sadhya. I have probed the Nyaya Shastra many times with the inquiry as to what are sadhya and sadhan. However, the Nyaya Shastra 
remains completely silent on this point. It has not supplied me with the answer. Please tell me your conclusions regarding Sadhya and Sadhan. Sri Raghunath Das Babaji was a disciple of Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, and he was not only an erudite scholar, but also a self-realized saint. He had lived for a long time at Radha Kund, under the shelter of Sri Das Goswami's lotus feet, and every afternoon he had heard from him the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Dev. Raghunath Das Babaji would regularly discuss philosophical truths with Krishna Das Kaviraj Mahashai, and whenever some doubt arose, they resolved it by inquiring from Sri Das Goswami. After both Raghunath Das Goswami and Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami left this world, Sri Raghunath Das Babaji came to Sri Mayapur and became the principal Pandit Babaji in Sri Gauda Mandal. He and Prem Das Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai of Sri Godaram often discussed topics of Sri Hari, absorbed in Prem. Babaji, Nyaya Panchanana Mahashai Anyone who studies the Nyaya Shastra and then inquires about Sadhya and Sadhan is certainly blessed in this world because the chief aim of the Nyaya Shastra is to compile axiomatic truths through logical analysis. It is a waste of time to study the Nyaya Shastra just to learn how to engage in dry argument and debate. If one does so, his study of logic has produced an illogical result. His labor is futile and he has spent his life in vain. Sadhya means the truth, tattva, that is attained by undertaking a specific practice. The practice is called sadhan, and it is the means that one adopts to obtain that sadhya, goal. Those who are bound by maya view different objects as the ultimate goal of life according to their individual tendencies and qualifications. In reality, however, there is only one supreme goal. There are three goals that one may try to attain and different individuals will choose one or the other according to their tendency and adhika, eligibility. These three goals are bhukti, material enjoyment, mukti, liberation, and bhakti, devotional service. Those who are ensnared in worldly activities and who are distracted by desires for material pleasure take bhukti as their goal. The shastras are compared to a cow, kamadenu, that fulfills all desires. For a human being can obtain whatever object he desires from them. The shastras, dealing with kamakanda, have explained that material enjoyment is the sadhya, goal, for those who are eligible to engage in fruitive action. And these shastras delineate all varieties of material pleasure that one could possibly strive to attain in this world. The jivas who have accepted material bodies are particularly fond of sensual enjoyment, and the material world is an abode to facilitate this. The pleasure one enjoys through the senses from birth until death is known as enjoyment pertaining to this life, ahika sukha. There are many different types of sensual pleasures that one may enjoy in the state one attains after death, and these are called amutrika sukha, enjoyment pertaining to the next life. For example, the pleasures of the celestial sphere include residing in Swaga, the higher planets, or Indra Loka, the planet of Indra, and witnessing the dancing of the celestial society girls, known as Apsaras, drinking the nectar of immortality, smelling the fragrant flowers, and seeing the beauty of the Nandana Kanana gardens, seeing the wonder of Indra Puri, hearing the melodious songs of the Gandharvas, and associating with the celestial damsels known as the Vidyadharis. Above Indra Loka in succession are the planets of Mahaloka, Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, and finally Brahma Loka, the highest planet in the material universe. The Shastras give fewer descriptions of Mahaloka and Jana Loka than are the celestial pleasures of Indra Loka, and fewer descriptions still of Tapa Loka and Brahma Loka. In contrast, the sensual pleasures of this earth planet, Burloka, is extremely gross. The rule is that the higher the planetary system, 
the more subtle are the senses and their objects. This is the only difference between these realms. Otherwise, the happiness available on all these planets is merely the pleasure of the senses, and there is no happiness other than this. Spiritual happiness, Chitsuka, is absent on all these planets, for the happiness found in such places is related to the subtle body, which consists of the mind, intelligence and ego, and is merely a semblance of pure consciousness. The enjoyment of all these types of pleasure is called bhukti, and the sadhana for the jivas trapped in the cycle of karma consists of the activities they adopt to fulfill their aspirations for bhukti. It is said in the Yajur Veda, 2.5.5 Svaga kamo svamedam yajeta Those who desire to attain the heavenly planets should perform the Ashvamedha Yajna. The Shastras describe many different types of sadhana to obtain bhukti, such as a particular type of fire sacrifice called Agnishtoma, oblations offered to a certain class of devatas, digging wells, building temples, and performing similar beneficial works for others, and ceremonies performed on the days of the new and full moon. Bhukti is the object of attainment, sadhya, for those who aspire for material enjoyment. Some of those who are oppressed by the miseries of material existence consider the fourteen planetary systems, which are the abodes of all material enjoyment, worthless. These people therefore desire to become free from the cycle of karma. They consider that mukti is the only sadhya, and that bhukti is simply bondage. Such people say, those whose inclination for material enjoyment has not yet waned may realize their goal of bhukti by following karma kanda. However, Bhagavad Gita 9.21 states, Kshine punye martya lokam vishanti when their pious credits have been exhausted, they again enter the mortal planets. This shloka establishes clearly and indisputably that bhukti is perishable and not eternal. Whatever is subject to decay is material, not spiritual. One should undertake sadhan only to obtain an eternal objective. Mukti is eternal, so it must certainly be the sadhya for the jivas. Mukti can be obtained by four types of sadhana. These are discriminating between eternal and temporary objects, renouncing enjoyment of the fruits of this world and the next, developing six qualities, such as control of the mind and senses, and cultivating the desire for liberation. These four activities are the true sadhana. This is the viewpoint of those who regard mukti as the object of attainment, and the shastras propounding jnana kanda present this analysis of sadhya and sadhan. The shastras are karma denu, and they arrange different situations for the jivas according to their adhika. Mukti is generally understood to be the cessation of the individual ego. However, if the jivas retain their individual existence and identities when they attain it, Mukti cannot be the final attainment. This means that the jivas can only take mukti up to the limit of annihilation of the individual self, nirvana. But the jivas are eternal, so they cannot really be annihilated. This is confirmed in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad 6.13 Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam That Ishvara is the supreme eternal being amongst all the eternal living beings and he is the supreme conscious entity amongst all conscious entities. This and other Vedic mantras establish that the jiva is eternal, and that annihilation of his individual existence, nirvana, is therefore impossible. Those who accept this conclusion understand that the jiva continues to exist as an individual after he attains mukti. Consequently, they do not accept bhukti or mukti as the ultimate goal. Rather, they consider that bhukti and mukti are actually extraneous goals which are foreign to the nature of the jiva. Every endeavor has a goal and some means to attain it. The result that one strives to attain is known as sadhya, and the practice one adopts to bring about that result is known as sadhan. 
If you reflect deeply, you will see that the goals of the living entities and the means that they adopt to attain them are like successive links in a chain. What is a sadhya now becomes the sadhan, the means to obtain the next sadhya later on. If one adopts this chain of cause and effect, one eventually comes to the final link in the chain. The effect or sadhya that is attained at that final stage is the highest and ultimate sadhya, which does not become a sadhan for anything else because there is no other sadhya beyond it. When one crosses all the links in this chain of sadhya and sadhan, one eventually reaches the final link, which is known as bhakti. Bhakti is therefore the highest sadhya, because it is the jiva's eternal state of perfection. Every action in human life is a link in the chain of sadhan and sadhya, or cause and effect. The karma section of this chain of cause and effect consists of many links joined together. When one progresses beyond this, a further series of links form another section known as Gyan. Finally, the Bhakti section begins where the Gyan section ends. The final Sadhya in the chain of Karma is Bhukti. The final Sadhya in the chain of Gyan is Mukti. And the final Sadhya in the chain of Bhakti is Prema Bhakti. If one reflects upon the nature of the Jiva's perfected state, one must conclude that Bhakti is both Sadhan and Sadhya. Karma and Gyan are not the final Sadhya and Sadhan, for they are only intermediate stages. Brajanath There are many prominent statements in the Upanishads that do not establish that Bhakti is supreme, or that it is the ultimate Sadhya of attainment. It is said in the Brihat Aranyakya Upanishad, 4.5.15 and 2.4.24, Kena Kam Pashyet, Who should see? Whom will they see? And by what means? It is also stated in the Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad, 1.4.10, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. It is said in the Aitareya Upanishad, 3.1.3, Prajnanam Brahman, Consciousness is Brahman. And in the Chandyoga Upanishad, 687 it is said tattvam ashi svetatiko o svetaketu you are that brahman considering all these statements what is wrong in regarding mukti as the supreme sadhya babaji i have already explained that there are many different types of sadhya according to different tendencies one cannot accept the validity of mukti as long as one has any desire for bhukti and many of the statements in shastra are written for people on that level. For instance, the Apastamba Shrota Sutra 2.1.1 states, Akshayam Havai Chatumasya Yagina. Those who observe the vow of Chatumasya obtain perpetual residence in heaven. Does this mean that Mukti is a worthless goal? The Kamis cannot discover the recommendations from Shastra for Mukti. But does that mean that Mukti is not described anywhere in the Vedas? A few of the Rishis who recommend the path of karma maintain that renunciation is only prescribed for those who are incompetent and that those who are competent should perform karma. This is not actually true. These instructions are given for people on lower levels of spiritual advancement in order to promote their faith in their respective positions. It is inauspicious for jivas to neglect the duties for which they are responsible. If one carries out one's duties in full faith that they are appropriate for one's present level, one easily gains access to the next level of qualification. Consequently, prescriptions in the Vedas promoting this type of faith have not been condemned. On the contrary, if one condemns such prescriptions, one is liable to fall down. All jivas who have attained elevation in this world have done so by strictly adhering to the duties for which they were qualified. Jnana is actually superior to karma because it yields mukti. Nonetheless, the shastras that discuss competence for karma praise karma most highly and do not substantiate the preeminence of jnana. Similarly, where the shastras discuss competence for jnana, we find all the mantras that you have mentioned which praise mukti. However, 
Just as eligibility for jnana is superior to that for karma, the eligibility for bhakti is superior to that for jnana. Mantras such as tattvam asi and ahambramasmi praise impersonal liberation and they strengthen the faith of those who seek it to follow the path for which they are qualified. For this reason, it is not wrong to establish the eminence of Gyan. However, Gyan is not the ultimate sadhan, and the sadhya of Gyan, namely mukti, is not the ultimate sadhya. The Vedic mantras establish the final conclusion that bhakti is the sadhan, and prem bhakti is the sadhya. Brajanath the mantras that I quoted are principal statements of the Vedas, known as Mahavakyas. How can the sadhya and sadhan that they put forward possibly be extraneous? Babaji The Vedic statements you quoted just a moment ago are not described as Mahavakyas anywhere in the Vedas, nor have they been described as superior to other statements. Teachers of Gyan have proclaimed that these statements are Mahavakyas in order to establish the preeminence of their own doctrine. But in reality, Pranava, Om, is the only Mahavakya. All other Vedic statements relate only to particular aspects of Vedic knowledge. It would not be incorrect to refer to all the statements of the Vedas as Mahavakyas. However, it is dogmatic to single out one particular statement of the Vedas as the Mahavakya and to label all others as ordinary. Those who do so are committing an offense to the Vedas. The Vedas describe many extraneous goals and the means to attain them. So they sometimes praise Karmakanda and sometimes Mukti. But in the ultimate analysis, the Vedas conclude that Bhakti alone is both Sadhan and Sadhya. The Vedas are like a cow and Sri Nanda Nandana is the milkman. In the Bhagavad Gita 646-47, he has revealed the purport of the Vedas regarding their ultimate aim. Tapasvi bio diko yogi, jnani bio pi mato dikaha, karmi bhyash cha diko yogi, tasmad yogi bavarjuna, yogi nam apisarvesham, madgatenan taratmanaha, shradavan bhajate yomam, same yukta tamomataha. O Arjuna, a yogi is greater than all types of ascetics, fruitive workers, and those who cultivate impersonal knowledge aiming at liberation. Therefore become a yogi, and I consider that the greatest of all yogis is one who is attached to me with firm faith, and one who constantly worships me with full expression of the heart. It is said in the Svetashvatara Upanishad 6.23, Yasya Deve Parabhaktir Yata Deve Tata Goro, Tasyaite Katita Hyarta, Prakashante Mahatmanaha. All the confidential purports of the Vedas are fully revealed to that great soul who has the same Parabhakti for his Gurudev as he has for Sri Bhagavan. It is said in the Gopala Tapani Upanishad, Purava Vibhag 15, Bhaktiya Asya Bhajanam Tad Ihamutropadi. Nyerashyanaiva mushyim manasa kalpanam etad eva chanaish karmyam. Bhakti performed for the pleasure of Sri Krishna is known as bhajan. This means to give up all desires for enjoyment in this world and the next, to dedicate one's mind unto Krishna, and to develop a feeling of complete unity with him because of an overwhelming sense of prem. This bhajan also entails freedom from all result-orientated activity. It is said in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad 148, Atmanam Eva Pariyam Upashita. One should worship the Supreme Soul, Sri Krishna, as the dearest object of one's affection. In the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad 456, it is also said, Atmava Are Drastavya. Shotavyo mantavyo niditya sitavya. O oh, my tree, one should see, hear about, think of, and meditate upon the supreme absolute truth, Paramatma. When one studies these Vedic statements carefully, it is clear that bhakti is the best form of sadhan. Brajanath. The Kamakanda section of the Vedas 
gives instructions to perform bhakti to Ishwara, who bestows the results of all action. In the Gyan Kanda section, we also find instructions to satisfy Hari by performing bhakti through the medium of the four types of sadhan, known as sadhan chatustaya. So how can bhakti be the sadhya if it is the means to obtain bhakti and mukti? Since bhakti is the means, it ceases to exist when it produces bhakti or mukti. This is the general principle. Please educate me on this question. Babaji, it is true that performing the regulated practices sadhan of bhakti in Karmakanda gives material enjoyment, and bhakti sadhan performed in Gyankanda gives mukti. One cannot achieve any result without satisfying Bhagavan, and he is only satisfied by bhakti. He is the reservoir of all potencies, and whatever potency is found within the jivas or within inert matter is only an infinitesimal display of his potency. Karma and Gyan cannot satisfy Bhagavan. They can only produce results with the help of Bhakti Abbas, and not independently. For this reason, it is enjoined that the practice of Karma and Gyan should include at least some semblance of Bhakti. Accordingly, the Bhakti seen in Karma and Gyan is a mere semblance of devotion, not Shuddha Bhakti. And it is this Bhakti Abbas that is instrumental in bringing forth the results of those pursuits. There are two types of Bhakti Abbas, pure Bhakti Abbas and adulterated Bhakti Abbas. I shall describe pure Bhakti Abbas later, but for the present you should know that there are three types of adulterated Bhakti Abbas. These are Bhakti Abbas adulterated with fruit of action, Bhakti Abbas adulterated with monistic knowledge and Bhakti Abbas adulterated with both fruit of action and monistic knowledge. While a person is performing a yagya, he may say, O Indra, O Pushana, the Devata of the Sun, please be merciful and give us the results of this yagya. All activities exhibiting a semblance of bhakti adulterated with this type of desire are known as a semblance of bhakti adulterated with fruitive action. Some magnanimous souls have referred to this type of adulterated bhakti as devotion mixed with fruitive action, karma mishra bhakti. Others have described it as activities to which the symptoms of bhakti are indirectly attributed, aropa siddha bhakti. Another person may say, O Yadu Nandana, I have come to you out of fear of material existence. I chant your name, Hare Krishna, day and night. Please grant me liberation. O Supreme Lord, you are Brahman. I have fallen into the trap of Maya. Please deliver me from this entanglement and let me merge in oneness with you. These sentiments are a semblance of bhakti adulterated with monistic knowledge. Some magnanimous souls have described this as devotion mixed with monistic knowledge, Gyan Mishra Bhakti and others as activities to which the symptoms of bhakti are indirectly attributed, Aropa Siddha Bhakti. These adulterated forms of devotion are different from Shuddha Bhakti. It is said in the Gita, 6.47, Shradhavan Bhajate Yomam Same Yukta Tamo Mataha I consider that one who worships me with faith is the best of all yogis. The bhakti to which Sri Krishna is referring in this statement is Shuddha Bhakti, and this is our sadhan. When it is perfected, it is prem. Karma and Gyan are the means to obtain bhakti and mukti, respectively. They are not the means by which the jiva can obtain his eternal constitutional position of divine love. When Brajanath had heard all these conclusive truths, he was unable to make further inquiries that day. Instead, he reflected within himself. The examination and discussion of all these subtle philosophical truths is superior to the dialectical analysis of the Nyaya Shastra. Babaji Mahashai is vastly learned in these matters. I will gradually acquire knowledge by inquiring from him about these topics. It is quite late, so I should return home now. Thinking thus, he said, Babaji Mahashai, today by your mercy 
I have received essential superior knowledge. I would like to come to you from time to time to receive this type of instruction. You are a deeply realized scholar and a great teacher. Please be merciful to me. Kindly permit me to ask you just one more question today, since it is already late, and I will return home when I have heard your answer. Did Sri Sachinandan Gauranga write any book in which all of his instructions can be found? If he did, I am anxious to read it. Babaji Mahashai replied, Sriman Mahaprabhu did not write any book of his own, but his followers wrote many books on his order. Mahaprabhu personally gave the jivas eight instructions in the form of aphorisms named Shikshastika. These are like a necklace of jewels for the bhaktas. In these eight shlokas, he has imparted the instructions of the Vedas, the Vedanta, the Upanishads and the Puranas in a concise and confidential manner. Based on these confidential instructions, the bhaktas have composed ten fundamental principles known as Dashamula. This Dashamula succinctly describes both Sadhya and Sadhan with reference to the topics of Sambandha, Abhideya and Prayojan. You should understand this first. Whatever you order, it is my duty to fulfill, said Brajanath. You are my Shiksha Guru. I will come tomorrow evening and take instruction from you on Dashamula. Brajanath then offered Dandavat Pranam to Babaji Mahashai, who embraced him with great affection. My son, said Babaji, you have purified the Brahmana lineage. It will give me great pleasure if you come tomorrow evening. Thus ends the twelfth chapter of Jaivadharma, entitled Nitya Dharma Sadhan and Sadhya.